Welcome to the Meet the CEO show on Core Finance. My name is Simon French and I'm the Chief Economist of Stockbrokers, Pamela Gordon. I'm also joined by David Buick, Pamela's legendary city commentator. It is our pleasure to welcome to the show George Maxwell, CEO of Eland Oil & Gas. Eland is an independent oil and gas company focused on production, development and exploration in West Africa, particularly the highly prolific Niger Delta region. Eland is listed on the London AIM market with the ticker ELA.L. George, can I extend a huge welcome to you from us both? George has been CEO of Eland for three years, having served on the board since September 2009. George has over 20 years oil industry experience in both the producing and service manufacturing arena. He's held previous high-profile roles with ADEX and ABB Oil and & Gas and has worked across the world during his very distinguished career. Eland is currently valued at $120 million, with shares up 35% since the start of 2017. Since it floated in August 2012, Eland has exhibited more resilience than the benchmark UK-listed oil and gas sector and has outperformed that index by 33%. George, can you give viewers a brief rundown on Elland, its assets, and why Nigeria? Well, um, we formed Elland back in 2010. Uh, a partner and myself uh, were ex uh, um, ADEX employees. So we, worked, we both worked and lived in Nigeria through 2004 towards 2010 when uh, ADEX was sold to Sinopec for a considerable sum, one of the most successful divestitures in, uh, in Nigerian history. Um, we looked at the opportunity, having lived and worked there, um, we see, saw great potential. Uh, we saw that we had had uh, some success with ADEX and we looked to reinvest both our intellectual and financial capital back into the country. Nigeria is one of the few places where, that has a, a, a very stable fiscal environment. Um, unlike places like the UK or the US, you don't see windfall profit tax coming through from Nigeria when they're high oil prices. Equally, there are some investment uh, incentives given at low oil prices and, and Eland actually enjoys one of those investments right now through its, uh, its joint venture company, Elcrest, with uh, the, the tax-free status on, on, on uh, from Pioneer Tax. Mm -hmm. the, main, the other main reason is obviously it's one of the most prolific oil and gas regions in the world. Uh, the largest producer in Africa. Um, it is quite an open market. So there's very few places where you can uh, buy assets of such size and such quality with low geological risk, but still have an environment where the monetization of the crude, which is really why we're all here, how, how do you, how do you uh, monetize the, the product, yeah. and the, the repatriation of those funds back to, to London or back to investors is, is, is always possible. So um, despite some of the, the uh, half-truths and, and misnomers around Nigeria, it's actually quite a stable place to do business when you look at the fiscal and business environment. And one of the challenges you've had since flotation in 2012 has been a tough sector, the oil and gas sector, and yet you've managed to weather it better than most. You mentioned pioneer tax, you mentioned a series of ways which Eland has managed to buck the market to some extent. What other things have you done to insulate from the vagaries of the global spot price? Well, there's, there's a couple of things there. One, you, you, you have to have a, a good asset. So you, the, you, at the end of the day, for an oil and gas company, all the value is, is under the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so having that being a given, uh, the, the complexities around Nigeria in order to, to monetize that position, all the complexities are actually above the ground. The, the geological risk is, is very low. Mm -hmm. So we, we've used both our experience in, 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 in country. Uh, we have uh, had a, uh, the key issue here is we don't control the commodity price. You know, mm. We're in a, a rather unique scenario in the oil and gas business where you're the, you sell your product at whatever the market sure. decides the product yep. is going to be worth. So the real area for us is to look for positions where we can have effective cost control, where we can uh, look at the lowest cost of operation, uh, where we have a strong and efficient fiscal environment. And at the end of the day, for, for, for Elan, we're looking at, uh, we're investing into the country. So you need to have a, a strong and uh, an understanding investor base that, that looks at the opportunities that we present, mm -hmm. which is, you know, there is all kinds of aspects of oil and gas from, from wildcat exploration through to producing assets. We, we chose to look at near-term production assets. Um, and... Because of uh, uh, the, the relatively low cost that we entered in, you know, we've, we've got ourselves in a position where 
at the time of high oil prices when big, large, deep water projects worth billions of dollars were, were being funded, mm. we, we, we came in with a, a, a rather modest and, and we find very attractive asset that, that can, can survive the right. vagaries of the ups and downs in the oil market. And you spoke about a patient shareholder register and, and one of the challenges you've had to deal with is the export route through the pipeline that has been off stream in 2016, early 2017. And yet there's good news that you've announced to the market in terms of being able to get oil back out without having to use barges. Can you just elaborate that and actually perhaps most interestingly, what shareholders can then look forward to in the second half of this year? Well, I think one of, the, one of the key attractiveness to us when we bought this asset was the near-term production opportunity. The uh, infrastructure was already in the asset, so you're buying infrastructure, and you were buying evacuation uh, route to the Fukada's terminal that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it ticked all the boxes for us, near-term production, opportunity to monetize, you know, the capital investment required it to, to generate that monetization opportunity was already invested. Uh, so it was, it was a very attractive opportunity. Now, take one of those factors out of the equation and, and you come across a problem, as, as, as we experienced in 2016. So you take away your monetization and evacuation route and you have to overcome that difficulty. Um, but, you know, being in the oil business my whole career, you, you, there's always something that you're going to overcome, whether you're drilling a well, whether you're manufacturing equipment. There's always a, 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 the, the factor of the unknown and that's why you know, we hire the professionals that we have to overcome that. We looked at uh, opportunities to produce alternative evacuation routes in, in a cost-effective way uh, whilst Fukados was, was shut down. Mm -hmm. Now, initially, we looked at the opportunity that the timely, uh, timing of the shutdown was going to be relatively short. It, it kept extending, kept extending, uh, until we came to a position where we really needed to look at the barging option or the tankering option, which in itself was not something that we really were too keen on doing. You know, we're an, uh, an oil company that produces in a, in a swamp pine environment. We're not a marine company. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you start moving the product uh, uh, using the tanker vessels, it's a completely different part of the business. So we weren't skilled in that area. We didn't have the expertise. What we did do is we spent a lot of time working with our peers who had decided to move earlier on the tankering option. We, we, we learned a lot of lessons learned and how they conducted their operations. And we looked at what, what, are we, what are we not so good at. Mm -hmm. We know how to produce oil, we know how to drill wells, we know how to do all these things. Do we know how to run vessels? That's not really our skill set. So we decided to look at a contracting strategy where we would deliver the crude to the vessel and someone else would take that vessel and deliver it to the terminal. So all the steps in between were the responsibility of the contractor. That's not something we, we were skilled at. We weren't used to marine operations, we weren't used to working with the port authorities. Some of our peer group decided to manage each part of that and that created a level of complexity that whenever you have a level of complexity in our operations, it's an opportunity for failure. Yeah. We tried to minimise that position by just saying, we'll deliver the crude to you, 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 you pick at. it up, yeah. we do yeah. what we're good at and let someone else, we, we paid a premium for mm -hmm. this and I accept mm -hmm. that, let someone else do what they're good at to deliver a product. And you mentioned a couple of times already in this interview the quality of the assets. And I actually just want to drill into the numbers because it's for people not familiar with the story, these are quite spectacular numbers. Cost of extraction, $6 a barrel. Cost of transportation with the pipeline, $2.50 a barrel. And then a 20% royalty tax on top of that. So a very low break even cost, particularly when Brent is touching around $60 a barrel today. Could you just unpack what that potentially means when you start to ramp up production in terms of those financials and how that makes you competitive, almost agnostic of the global spot price? Well, you are, but you're not. I mean, we can, we can never ignore the top line revenue position that we're, sure. we're all yeah. controlled by, but, but because the headline number of oil impacts so many things, particularly sentiment and investing in EMP companies. Um, we are in a low-cost environment. I mean, the, the, and it goes back to asset selection. You know, as I mentioned before, when we bought the asset, we bought it complete with infrastructure. We bought it complete with export opportunities. Mm -hmm. We bought it complete with pre-drilled wells that had been shut down. So the opportunity to bring that production back on at, at relatively low cost was, was, uh, was, was already in front of us. Now, what we did do back in 2014, we had a change in strategy. We, the asset itself had quite a small, low well inventory, only seven or eight wells drilled. Um, 
and therefore the workover potential was quite small. So we had a strategy pre-2014 to drill new wells. Mm -hmm. Quite capital intensive, but when you're looking at our business, it, you know, it's much preferable to drill a new well in 2017 or 2016 than go into a 1972 well and rework it because you know, it's been down there a long time. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, in 2014, I was at a conference and I looked at the majority of my peer group we're doing exactly that. I have my peer group going in and re-entering on well, old wells and increasing production. So we looked at our well inventory and decided to, to look at two particular wells that were in production to see if we could enhance that. Mm -hmm. And what we're enjoying today, the production uh, gross of over 12,500 barrels a day, is, is a product of, of, of that strategy. Mm -hmm. and last year, Palma 3, we re-entered and re-perforated and sealed certain sections of the well, re-perforated new reservoirs, effectively creating in Oklahoma 3 a brand new well through existing infrastructure. And, and the total cost of that was around $3 million for both wells. So we, we managed to capture that low cost mm. uh, production enhancement. Now, I've spent a lot of my time in, in the North Sea, and when people talk about workovers, they talk about things called enhanced oil recovery methods. We're not talking about that here. A workover on OP3 is a brand new well, so this well will, will produce for the next 15 years at a, at a very minimal cost. Um, you have to have the quality of the asset to give you that low cost opportunity. Yeah. Um, and, and you know there are pl plenty of oil and gas producing areas all around the world, all with different cost structures. You see in the Gulf of Mexico, they go for, for you know, uh, uh, 3,000 meter wells. Mm -hmm. you know, very, very prolific, but also very, very expensive. We, can, we don't have those kind of flow rates, but we do have the very low cost opportunities, and it's all driven from what you have below the ground. I, I, I know this is the $64,000 question. I don't want to ask it, but I'm going to. <laughs> uh, like all businesses in the sector, the investment case is heavily predicated on the outlook of the global oil price. What's your view on it? Horrible question, it's but always forgive is, me. Uh, it's a but, stupid but question, it's but not, it has to be asked. It's one, it's one of the questions, if you're running an oil company, you, you, you're always asked and you're, you're always expected to know the answer. And, and the, the best answer is, if I did know the answer, I wouldn't be running an oil company. But the, the, the way, for our position, you know, um, we have to get our production as competitive and as efficient to the point of monetization as we can. Uh, we, we, the real issue around the oil price is, is about future investment. So when you look at oil price, you're saying, I've got more wells to drill. At what oil price does, does this investment make economic sense for me? It doesn't really, for your production costs, uh, as we discussed earlier, you know, mm -hmm. being a $6 mm -hmm. extraction cost and, and $2.50, that's a given. You can make that as efficient as possible, but that well's already flowing. The oil price go going forward is all about are you willing to continue with your investing activity and at what price mm -hmm. does that investing activity work for you? So for, if we're, for us, it's a mixture of the, the geology, and we always come back to geology because that's where the money is. It's a, it's a, a potential on the fiscal regime that you're operating on and, and uh, the, uh, the, the blend of your crude. So for us, we, right now, we've uh, been running our base case uh, at 40 to $45. Mm -hmm. My expectation through 2017 uh, and, and into beyond 2018 is to find around about 50 to 60 dollars. But at all points, our, our investing activity is is, uh, is economic. I mean, for for the wells we're producing uh, are planning to drill now. They're they're running around about 13 to 15 million dollars per well, and they're roughly working on about a, a 90 day payback at at uh, 45 dollar oil. And a lot of the recent uh, strong performance has been based on impressive uptime numbers and for those viewers who might not be familiar with uptime on the, on the, on the pipeline, that's key to getting decent export performance, decent cash flow. Can you just talk through how you've managed to achieve that and whether it can be sustained into the second half of the year? Um, certainly the last four months uptime performance have been exceptional. Uh, I think we just reported into the market today 1% uh, downtime, so 99% uptime. Um, now that's been that's been driven primarily because Forcaris has been closed for such a long time. We're, we're all producers are pushing a lot down the line right now to to try and get that cash flow catch up that they've sure. been missing for the mm -hmm. last 15 months. Mm -hmm. um, we do have to go through uh, PPM plan preventative maintenance online, so we do anticipate that number to come down because it certainly can't go can't go up. Um, so the the focus on on uptime, if we look back. Uh, 
at uh, 2015, the last time we had a full year of production, mm -hmm. we were around about 95% uh, on our own asset uh, production uptime mm -hmm. and about 85% overall. So we, we control uh, the first 36 kilometres of the evacuation and Shell control the, the balance of the 36 kilometres towards the Forcados. Mm -hmm. um, I do expect uh, when we're doing these numbers, when we're running our... our, our uh, uh, revenue estimates mm -hmm. or running our economics, we, we run on an 80 to 85 percent uptime basis. Um, and when we do see we're, we're ahead of the curve, especially when the oil price is increasing, you know, that early monetization, mm -hmm. because the oil is always worth something in the ground, but it's certainly worth a lot more when we get it through the facilities. Um, you know, it's uh, if we can maintain around about the 85 percent level, that, that's a very efficient mm -hmm. operation for us. Let me just come in here because I think this is. Nigeria is synonymous with oil. I mean, all of the great companies had a pop there, done well. George, I think Eland is incredibly lucky to have you because you've spent so many of your really good years in Nigeria and you know it like the back of your hand. But like any slightly doubtful retail investor, what I'd like from you is a little bit of clarification on the community, your partners, the local and national government, security. Are you happy with it? I mean, you're comfortable with it as a, as a sort of an environment to make you know, the great success of the company that you're currently doing? I think absolutely. I mean, I've spent time in Nigeria, I've lived there. In running any company, whether it's an oil company or any other type of company, you have to take account of all stakeholders mm. in the business, whether it's the investment community, mm. a retail investor or an institutional investor, all the way through to the community that you operate within. Yep. And we have a responsibility there. So um, for me, we, we do run community programs. Um, I'm very, very pleased that finally we've got the drilling rig in the community. I mean, that's been a major event for the company. Mm. I think it's been a major event for the community as well. It provides mm. uh, work uh, while the rig's in location. It's the first time a rig's been there since 1981. Mm. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a big event and yeah. this is a very big piece of kit. So it can be seen from a number of miles as it's coming in. So from the, we, we do have a number of CSR projects. We make sure that when we're going in to operate both on workovers or drilling activity, that we award uh, a lot of local contracts that mm -hmm. are awarded within the community. Yep. Uh, on, the, on the fiscal and political environment, given the stability of the fiscal regime, uh, the main uh, um, cash flow generator for, for, the, for the economy is oil. Um, you're in a very, uh, a very stable environment. And as I said, you know, we, they're still promoting investing uh, incentives to, to attract foreign investment in. And I've said many times to, to both uh, to the government when I meet them in Nigeria, you know, our, as, as Ellen, our only assets are, are in Nigeria. So whenever I'm promoting the company, uh, I'm very comfortable at being there. I'm looking for investors to, to equally be comfortable, not just in the environment we operate, but the, the, they have a management team, both UK and Nigerian, uh, that run this company that uh, can deliver the return for them. Fantastic. And, and one of the things that a, a number of viewers will be looking out for are key milestones. And one of the things to look forward to, I think, is the sidetrack in Oppo Armour 7, which has the potential to ramp up production by about 50% for about 12,500 to 18,000 barrels a day. How is progress going on that? When can you expect to update the market? Well, we, we started, uh, uh, we moved the rig into the location about 10, Ten days ago, two weeks ago, uh, mm -hmm. it's been on location um, uh, over the over the, the well site. Uh, we we gave a little bit of an update, I think, to market about a week ago, where we successfully um, secured the the old well mm -hmm. and and kicked off the side track. Um, so the the if you're looking at the levels of complexity in a drilling well, we've 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 kicked off the two most complex parts of the operation. Um, we do expect to, to complete or get to TD on the well. Uh, by mid-October, right. uh, and then look uh, to to announce that to market. At the same time, as drilling the well, we're actually uh, preparing the uh, flow line activity from the flow station to the well, so that we can hook up the well very quickly mm. to to production. Uh, we expect to be able to do that within three days of the rig moving uh, off-site. Fantastic, and and just. Across the wider portfolio, you've got Betty Oaken. What is the drilling plans over the next 12 months at that, that area? Well, we've got two wells approved at the moment. One is this uh, OP7 sidetrack that mm -hmm. we're currently engaged on. And then we have uh, Betty Oaken 1. So that it, it's the next well in the program mm -hmm. uh, for us to move the rig to and, and start an early production system in there. Um, it's to the far east of the block, so it's, uh, it's about 
30 or 40 kilometers uh, for the rig to travel to get there. So we're looking to optimize. Is there an opportunity to do something uh, closer to the flow station for easier monetization? And we're, we're in discussions with, with our partners to, to see if they, uh, they agree with that, that solution. But um, Betty Oaken is, uh, uh, as you've seen from perhaps our Capital Markets Day's presentation, mm. is, is potential to be very prolific. I mean, we're looking at the first well to deliver close to 10,000 barrels a day. Uh, and so it, yeah. it, it, it is, a, it is a, a bit of a game changer. And I wanted to come on to that because the market capitalization, 120 million, you have the potential, if Betty Oak and Opoama 7 go as you expect, to be one of the largest, if not the largest, oil producer on AIM. What is the market currently missing that you feel it needs to understand to get that leg up in the, in the share price? Yeah, it's, um, I think we've only recently been delivering the 12,500 a day gross. Um, now, that work, as I mentioned earlier, came from the activities of last year, and then all of a sudden the company's into an enforced hiatus because of uh, Focaris uh, interruption. If we had not had that issue with Focaris, you would have seen the company gradually building up its production mm -hmm. uh, and, and being much yeah. more communicative to market as, and, uh, as we build up. So what the market's seen is effectively a company shut down, no production, a company going to a shipping operation, which is a little bit experimental to make sure mm -hmm. we have an alternative export route. And then all of a sudden, the pipeline comes back and the next thing the market hears is the company's doing 12,500 a day. Where did that come from? Yeah. So I think we've got a little bit of catch up to do with market. Um, I think uh, with some of the announcements we've made recently, we're, we're beginning to demonstrate that whilst we had a, 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 a tough time in 2016 and early 2017, uh, the Q3, you've really seen the company start to generate a lot of cash and start to be able to work its way through the difficulties we had in 2016, and that's you know, going to continue through through the second half of, uh, of 2017. The, the position of um, slightly more higher production, higher mm -hmm. oil price, yep. all that opportunity of windfall cash coming down to us is, uh, is allowing us to, to move this uh, forward at a much faster rate than we expected. And, and I think that's then wraps up where we're looking at in terms of H2 performance being stronger than H1 and, and reinforcing the investment case. You mentioned the October milestone in terms of updating on Opoama 7. Just looking a little bit further ahead, where, where over a sort of two year, three, two year, three year window do you want the drilling to have gone to, the production rates to have gone to, and, and the scale of the ambition? Well, this is where I take you back to, to our presentation back in April when we did our first capital markets day. And uh, there were two things that were key to me there uh, to demonstrate to market. One, uh, my investors, the market, uh, this audience, they see me all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't see the team that's behind me that, that are helping me produce the kind of results that we have. So the Capital Markets Day was an ideal opportunity for each of the disciplines that work within the company to present, to present their yeah. position. And one of the key things that came out of there is, you, if, uh, is the, the analysis that we've done on, on a G&G &G basis of the subsurface where you look at the production potential of the reserves, not exploration, not appraisal work, the actual reserves, proven oil in the ground. And if you look at that particular graph, which you'll find on our website, you'll see that production potential of existing reserves can go up in excess of 80,000 barrels a day right. in the next two year period. Yeah. That's capex unconstrained, yeah. mm. but the oil is there. So there's no question the oil, again, I come back to where we started from. My job is to make sure we can get the most efficient monetization of what we know is already there. That was wonderful. George Maxwell, CEO of Eland Oil & Gas, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hugely excited, George. We wish you well. Thank you very much.